<laughs> no vision. It's like my binoculars are closed. I don't see it happening in the moment. I don't see it happening in the moment. It's very frustrating. Because I think, as I said, it's the Everglades from my perspective. You know, you just, you have to pull out the card. Um, I don't see any, pardon? Then what will happen? Um, eventually, eventually, one, someone's going to twist someone's arm. I mean, in order to go back. Problem is that we're at a point when uh, Obama, President Obama, it's his last year. So I don't think he's going to do much about it. No. Um, it's always been that, that it's always been like that. You know, I spoke to several legislators this morning, and we spoke about it. Last year of tenure, it's just nobody does anything. That scares me. That scares me. I have no doubt. It scares me because we are in the midst of a third intifada. They can call it whatever they like, tear away. This is a third intifada. This is an intifada that I remember. The first intifada, when I was a student in Jerusalem, I went to law in Jerusalem, I remember myself getting off the bus with a backpack here and a backpack here in order not to be stabbed. But that, that was, you know, like, common thing. Um, eventually, in order for Israel to thrive and to exist, it needs to coexist. And I don't want to be a bad financial state, I'm sorry, you know. Uh, I just heard there was a professor here that I truly respect, Professor Shlomo Ben Amin, was just recently mm -hmm. in the area. And he was saying, if you want to understand what a binational country is, just look at what's happening now. That's going to happen on a daily basis. No, it's not it's happening now on a daily basis. But can you imagine a reality of that sort? No, I don't want to imagine a reality of that sort. So that's why we need to be brave, proud, definitive, about the character of Israel to be. And from my perspective, any Arab Israeli who wants to live in Israel, and a lot of them do, a lot of them do, I have so many friends in the Arab sector, a lot of them do, they want to live in Israel, they want to live in peace. A lot of them are now, they, they, they are well educated, the women drive, the women go to universities, they are doctors, they set up startups, if you go to Nazareth, it's amazing. So, so many things are happening like undercurrents, but they're not, you know, they're not becoming the reality. And the reality, this is the vision. This is what we need to be. Arab Israelis are equal citizens in Israel that is Jewish and democratic, but Jewish nonetheless. And I hope that we will be able to get there. And we're working very hard on it. I think sometimes I think Prime Minister Netanyahu is very, very much held by politics by the right pulling him to the right. Instead of his common sense, he's a very smart man. And knowing what needs to be done. I mostly want people, you know, Clinton spoke at length last week about the constant fight between hope and fear. And it's the hope that you win. And that what it's happening is brought about. I think that's one of the most if you would ask me what is the most important thing in the job description of an Israeli prime minister, I would say two things. To actually bring security and bring hope. These are the two most major things. And I hope eventually that's where we'll go. Yes. Thank you. This is probably part B to that question, talking about the Jewish and democratic state as we got Palestinians, but in regard to the Jewish people themselves, being like so um, split into so many extremes, how do you not see it in any way a contradiction? What's your vision of that? Oh, it's so interesting to be Jewish, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Jewish and democratic in its core values, even though we see ourselves as a chosen people, and I never speak about ourselves as a chosen people, even though I know that's what's written in the scriptures, but it doesn't mean that that's how we should behave as a chosen people. You know, there's no arrogance that needs to accompany naturally Judaism from my perspective. From my perspective, and I spoke about it left in my initial, uh, in my maiden speech in the Knesset, is that Judaism hugs people. And from my perspective, you know, my great aunt, who lived in Safed and was very influential of my life, um, she was my grandmother's sister-in-law. She was she raised basically my grandfather, and I was I would go to her on a weekly basis on Fridays. They, she spoke Yiddish. She spoke Hebrew as well, but she spoke Yiddish. And I had to learn Yiddish when I was a teenager. I spoke both Espanol and Yiddish, both languages of the Jews. And 
And I remember her. She was the most tolerant person that I know. And she was ultra, ultra, ultra religious, ultra orthodox. And she was the most tolerant person I've ever met. And that is what Judaism is to me. Being tolerant is Judaism. Those people who committed this assassination in Duma are not Jewish. The people who have hit Rabbi Asherman two weeks ago in the hills of Binyamin are not Jewish. A Jewish person does not do things like that, from my perspective. You would ask the Muslims that are not fundamentalists, they would say the same about Islam. They would say the same about Islam. So there is a common denominator between being Jewish and democratic, having the same universal values of tr really respect by friend. Really, the basic, basic, basic values are the same. Now we need to make sure that the natural arrogance of being the chosen people does not become our DNA. It's not my DNA, and I'm very Jewish. So it's not my DNA. And that is a challenge. That is a challenge. Yep. So you mentioned um, the disenfranchisement of the young people in the United States, but what about the disenfranchisement of the young people in Israel? Um, and where, where is that? Um, how does that play out? And, and what kind of PR do we need to do there? <laughs> In what respect? In respect to, to well, Israel? Well, I guess in respect to um, to seeing the fundamentalism as um, as a given, to seeing um, to being on one side or the other, to, to having no yeah, you're talking about polarization. No yeah, <laughs> being very polarized. Right. The one thing that concerns me a lot of the time, I spoke about it in in Mount Her on Mount Herzl on November fourth, just a couple of days ago. Rabin wasn't a diplomat, by the way. He didn't always choose the right words, but he wasn't, he didn't feel that in order to lead, in order to rule, that he needs to decide, that he needs to speak out loud. He need, he need not shout, you know. A lot of the settlers were very, very close with him, and they speak about him till today as the only prime minister that always kept his word. Because when he said he stopped, he's gonna stop building in the settlements, he stopped, but when they needed anything, was it a road for security, he was always there for them. His door was open to those who did not choose him. Who did not, that's, that's by the way, my perspective of being an MK. I, my constituency is Israel. It's not only the people who, are, uh, uh, who chose the Zionist Union or picked me in the Labor Party. Um, going back to your question, there is no doubt that the way that we handle ourselves in public debate has gone very, very bad. It's gone very bad. Again, I blame Mark Zuckerberg, but it won't help me. Um, he because he did so Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, no, but it's, you know, obviously, uh, it's just a joke. Yeah. No, I um, <laughs> But there's no doubt that the, you know, it's inflammatory what's going on in the, in the web. And it's very, very concerning. Um, but if you look at a whole, the people in Israel young ones as well as adults. One piece. The question is the way, the road taken, chosen to reach that goal. But most of the people, and you, you could see that even during, the, um, there were a lot of polls taken uh, on Rabin's uh, 20th, uh, on the assassination 20th anniversary. It's such an unbecoming word, anniversary, that annoys the hell out of me. I love English, but anniversary is such an unbecoming word for an event like that. Um, so it is, it concerns me. It concerns me. Nonetheless, um, and I think as politicians, we have major, major responsibility to how it's handled, how it's taken care of. That's why I think incitement should be indicted. Yes. No choice. No choice. Incitement needs to not need, you know, needs to be indicted. Um, I'm hoping we're going there, mainly due to the fact that the person most incited towards nowadays is Ruby Rivlin. 
well, after Rabin was assassinated, I don't think completely grasped full meaning of the incitement that was going on before the assassination. I think only, only once he went into office and understood that he cannot go to the football games, to the soccer games of his favorite uh, uh, team, Bital Shalai, only then did he understand what the meaning of words is and what's the implication of words that are not chosen carefully. And he's incited towards in the worst way possible. I think it is the prime minister. In that respect, I think he has a major, major, major duty of lowering the flames. Um, he's not done enough so, so far. He's not done enough so far. I'm hoping for a better turnout soon. Uh, I think it's very important. I was at the railway um, and um, at, at the anniversary, whatever you want to call it, and it, I, I was, um, at, I mean, not understanding all the words that were spoken. However, I, I was um, buoyed by the fact that there were so many young people there. It's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. There were about 50 to 60,000 people. Uh, I'm, I'm,